you want to understand the modern world and where we are today, there's no better place to start than looking at F. Scott Fitzgerald because he was so complex and he was dealing with the complexity of American life and that still resonates today. St. Paul had this huge impact on Fitzgerald and Fitzgerald had an impact on St. Paul. St. Paul is the most important town uh, to F. Scott Fitzgerald's legacy. He lived all over the world but the vast majority of uh, experiences that he used in his novels and his writings either directly came from St. Paul, was planned in St. Paul, written in St. Paul, rewritten in St. Paul. Um, so St. Paul had this huge impact on his life up until he was probably about 40 and, and the Hollywood years. So if you read Fitzgerald's stories, um, they are awash in St. Paul imagery. F. Scott Fitzgerald was born in this apartment on September 24, 1896. It was considered a luxury apartment back then, um, befitting uh, the daughter of P.F. McQuillan, who was one of the richest men in St. Paul. Unfortunately, he died pretty young, and so, you know, the family was living off, you know, kind of the legacy money. But, but still, the McQuillans were well respected around uh, the town of St. Paul. Fitzgerald uh, took his first steps here. He, you know, he said his first words here. There were two uh, uh, sisters that died right before he was born. Um, he suggested that's why he became a writer. Um, and then he had another sister that was born when they were out in New York. But he said he didn't know that anything else existed in the universe until his younger sister was born. He left uh, about the time he was two years old because his father went to get a job in New York. Um, but uh, they came, of course, back to St. Paul. We're standing in front of St. Paul Academy, uh, the former St. Paul Academy. The school has moved now. Uh, Fitzgerald's parents had a lot of ambition for him, and of course that's why they named him Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, after a distant relative. Uh, the Francis also was the middle name of Philip Francis McQuillan, his grandfather, who had all the money. Um, so when the family moved back to St. Paul in 1908, his father could not even keep the family together uh, because of finances, but they still wanted to thrust him kind of into this St. Paul society. So what do you do? You send him to the most prestigious private school in St. Paul, St. Paul Academy. You send him to dancing lessons just a couple blocks away on Grand Avenue. Um, and so Fitzgerald was rubbing shoulders, of course, with the elite of Summit Avenue, even though his folks weren't quite there. Now, it's not that he was a poor boy. Um, he was like, Today you would think of him as like a millionaire amongst billionaires. You don't feel sorry for the millionaire. Many of his stories are about, you know, the influence of money and, and um, I wouldn't say the worship of money, but just the fact that money was such a big driver in, in the United States. He came back to St. Paul, as I said, just on the cusp of being a teenager. Um, he was very, uh, handsome, he was very, very smart, and um, he was a leader. He was a natural leader, but sometimes he was probably a little over-aggressive. So in the St. Paul Academy School Magazine, one of his friends said, will somebody poison Scotty to shut him up? Um, apparently he talked a lot. He um, wanted to play sports but he wasn't um, very big. He's, he was a little bit taller than I am, um, weighed a lot less than I do. <laughs> um, but he just, he was like on the third string baseball team. You know, I mean, how many students were here? Probably not, not that many. So he wasn't a great athlete. And so he realized he wasn't going to be the kind of hero athlete. And so he thought about other ways uh, to um, kind of gained notoriety and he found it through writing. He was writing detective stories. He liked to read them and so he would write them. Um, he was writing um, westerns. He was writing mysteries. Um, so he was writing about the Civil War because his father um, was alive, of course, during the Civil War and lived in Maryland. Um, and his relatives, you know, he heard stories about his relatives in the Civil War. So he was doing a lot of different kinds of genres. He was writing plays. Um, the plays were being performed around the town. 
and he was kind of gaining a little bit of notoriety in St. Paul. This row of Cass Gilbert designed townhomes is really important to F. Scott Fitzgerald. His parents lived in a couple different ones, believe it or not. Not only did they move from block to block, they literally moved from row, you know, townhome to townhome in the same row of townhomes. And they are associated with the two great loves of his life, uh, Ginevra King and uh, Zelda Zare. And he met, he was going east to school when Ginevra came to a party here and um, he fell in love with her and his parents were living at one of the townhomes here where he um, kind of moped about because of Ginevra. He eventually joined the army and went south and met Zelda um, and when she rejected him because he wasn't making enough money he came back to this town home at 599 Summit. This is where magic struck. Up in the third floor um, space up there, he rewrote the book that he'd written while he was in, army, in the army. It was called The Romantic Egotist. And eventually it was published by Scribner's um, This Side of Paradise. But he, he literally, you know, uh, thumbtacked in, you know, cards of chapters and worked really, really hard to rewrite the book. And Max Perkins liked it. Now, supposedly, after he uh, learned that the book was going to be published, he ran out onto Summit Avenue and said, my book's going to be published, my book's going to be published. His parents were kind of giving him a last chance, you know, get your novel published or go out and get a job, you know. And so he literally, one of his friends got him a job on James J. Hill's Railroad. Uh, he didn't last very long as a manual laborer, but then his book was published and every, his world completely changed. He, he got the girl of his dreams, you know, Zelda agreed to marry him. Um, his book was published. He became, he became the, um, literally the 21st century self-promoter. Um, we, you know, the, the, the difference between the Victorian age and the jazz age, you know, Fitzgerald exemplified that kind of um, exuberance and self-promotion that uh, you see continuing today. Um, his peers wouldn't have done the kind of things he did and um, so they probably looked down on him a little bit but he got a lot of publicity during his time. He wrote a, a pretty famous letter about being half black Irish and you know and then th the half of his father from the old southern you know family um, and he said he would grovel in front of kitchen maids and insult the rich. Um, so I suspect through his whole life he had a little bit of an inferiority complex, um, especially when he went out east to school and he, you know, he saw some people who made vast amounts of money. And that, of course, came out in Tom Buchanan in The Great Gatsby. Fitzgerald had a really interesting relationship with people with money. I mean, they were his friends, but I don't think he worshipped money. I mean, he, he was too frivolous with it. Um, now, in order to be frivolous with money, you had to have some, so obviously, you know, but he made a lot of money during his lifetime. He, he did make some money off his books. He made money off the motion pictures. He made money while he was in Hollywood. He made a potload of money selling short stories. And so he worked really hard. He made a lot of money, but he... Um, he didn't kind of like worship it. And I, I think he really felt the biblical, you know, it's the worship of money that's the root of all evil, not the money itself. When I have the opportunity to come to the ballroom here at the Louis Hill House, it is such a thrill for me because I know that this provided inspiration for Fitzgerald and the kind of stories that he was interested in to make money. The, the Saturday Evening Post stories, this is the epitome of that huge volume of work that he produced that he felt a little bit ashamed of, but are wonderful stories. And so I see this as a real positive place for his career.
There was one particular party at this house that actually Fitzgerald didn't attend, and apparently a young man, it was a costume ball, and Louis Hill liked to have costume balls, and this room would have been filled with people in different kinds of costumes. Well, a young man apparently dressed up in a camel's outfit and went to the wrong house. Um, who knows why? Anyway, the next day Fitzgerald heard about the story, and he said he tried to find out more information. Um, but then he just sat down and wrote a short story called The Camel's Back. Um, Fitzgerald said he didn't particularly like the story, but it won an O. Henry Award. It was his first story to win an O. Henry Award. It's a pretty nice story about a, uh, a costume party that takes place here at, at the Louis Hill House. He said it in um, Toledo, Ohio, but anybody who knows knows it was here at the Louis Hill House. A lot of people think Fitzgerald made his money off his writing um, early on, but actually he was making it from movies. And so it was the movie money that encouraged Zelda to marry him. And in fact, Camel's Back became a movie called Conductor 1492. It has very little to do with the story, but there is a dancing camel in the movie and that's about it. Um, and so this is uh, the scene for one of, as I said, an o, uh, Fitzgerald's O. Henry um, uh, prize winning stories. At this point, um, when he's writing these short stories for the Saturday Evening Post, he had already um, sold This Side of Paradise to Scribner's, but it took a while for the book to be published. In the meantime, short stories that he had already written, um, he was polishing and sending off to publications. He was writing other short stories and um, you know, selling them to the publications and also selling them to the movies. So at this point, he's in his 20s. What's really interesting is when I was first doing research here, I would ask his, you know, people who were still alive, who knew Fitzgerald, who were good friends with him. And we always kind of heard about this, you know, outsider, insider, and they all denied it. They said, no, he was a great friend. You know, he was not an outsider. You know, he was part of our group. Um, and I, and it, it kind of puzzled me where that, that whole idea came from. But then I started asking if their parents associated with his parents, no. So, you know, his mother and father, it, it kind of skipped a generation. So his grandparents associated with, you know, the, the wealthy people of Summit Avenue, and he did, but his parents didn't. Um, and so, there were reasons for that. As I said, his father had lost his job. He was unemployed. His mother was a little quirky. Um, and so they didn't run around a lot with the parents of the children that Fitzgerald ran around a lot with. And so I'm sure he, you know, you know got the feeling of also being a little bit of an outsider um, so that he could, um, you know, step back and objectively write about you know, that period without, you know, fawning, you know, over it. F. Scott Fitzgerald himself probably sat at this bar. I mean, he wrote almost everything down, but, you know, he didn't say I was at the basement bar, but I'm sure I'm guessing he was. And so, you know, this is um, a pretty special place for Fitzgerald scholars, you know, when they come to St. Paul to see the actual places where he, um, where he socialized, where he worked, where that inspired him. And so this is just one of the many places in St. Paul that uh, provide an inspiration for Fitzgerald and his stories. The University Club was the center, or was one of the centers of social life in St. Paul back then, still is today, lots of weddings here. And um, Fitzgerald was probably never a member, but he had a lot of friends who would have been, so he would have had access to these rooms. Um, he and uh, he met uh, you know several people here, including Donald Ogden Stewart, who he convinced to become a writer and then went on to win an Academy Award for a Philadelphia story. Um, and he and he had a party for Zelda when they were living at 626 Goodrich here. They called it the Bad Luck Ball because it was on Friday the 13th. And to show you the extent that they would go to to entertain their guests. Fitzgerald literally had a newspaper printed up, a full broadsheet newspaper printed up 
with stories about friends of his who would recognize the story. You would not want to be with a drunken Fitzgerald at a party, I am guessing. He got pretty obnoxious. So I would say he was part of the obnoxious drunks. Um, you know, he might pick up some of the glasses in this room and throw them. Um, he, you know, tip over chairs. Um, and, and Zelda was kind of the same way. And so the two of them together, if they had been drinking heavily, it, it probably could have been pretty bad. Yeah, so if I would have been with Fitzgerald, I would have preferred a semi-sober Fitzgerald. Probably one of the reasons he was never a member, in theory, you had to be a university graduate to become a member. And Fitzgerald had dropped out of Princeton. He said for medical reasons, um, his grades weren't very good. And, and so, but he loved Princeton. In fact, he was reading the Princeton Alumni Weekly when he passed away, supposedly. Um, he, he, wrote, um, he wrote the plays for the Triangle Club. Um, when he was a member there, they were the, the group that toured the United States doing these performances, and he toured with them. He actually came back to the Twin Cities to do a performance as a member of the Triangle Club. So, um, you know, Princeton w was a symbol to him, and it was important to him that he went there, and his whole life, despite the fact that he never graduated, Princeton uh, held a place in his heart, a very, uh, a very important spot, spot for him. After he had wooed and won Zelda, they were married in New York City. Um, neither her parents nor his parents came to the wedding. They did a European tour, just as his parents had done after their marriage. And then Zelda discovered she was pregnant, so they moved back to Montgomery to be close to her parents. But it didn't work out, so Fitzgerald wrote they moved back uh, home to St. Paul. Um, they lived in a house out in White Bear Lake, but it was just kind of a summer resort. They lived in a hotel. But of course, they were going to have a family, and so one of their good friends, Zandra Coleman, uh, her grandparents lived in this house, and, and she got it for them so they could literally move into this house uh, for the winter. It was a pretty brutal winter, and Fitzgerald had an office downtown. He was working very hard. He was working on the proof pages of The Beautiful and Damned. He was writing the play The Vegetable, and I think part of the set, actually, he took from this house. And Zelda was pretty bored. Uh, he tried to have parties for her at the university club. She didn't have a lot of friends. Um, a lot of his friends' wives didn't like her, probably because she was a little bit of a flirtatious Southern belle and all their husbands liked her. Um, but it just really wasn't going very well in St. Paul. Um, they made it through the winter. They tried to go back to White Bear Lake again, but it was pretty much decided by both of them that St. Paul was not going to be the place where they were going to make their home. And it had a lot to do with the winters here. Um, and so they moved back to New York. And then, of course, um, as we know, he lived in Europe. He lived out in Hollywood. Um, but this was, this was kind of the beginning of the end for him here in St. Paul. So they left St. Paul in 1922. Um, and despite the fact that he said he was going to bring Scotty back, their daughter who was born here, he never made it back to St. Paul. I think there were several influences St. Paul had on him. One was the Catholicism that, of course, St. Paul was, was and still is a very kind of Roman Catholic town. And his writing is filled with priests and good and bad. And a lot of people have written about, you know, that influence of religion on F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he got that in St. Paul. I also think his writing about the wealthy, of course, came from St. Paul. And so St. Paul had this uh, hold on him um, for most of his life. Uh, when he needed money, you know, he would write short stories about St. Paul. And so um, throughout much of his life, he just, he was, a, you know, a St. Paul, a Midwest boy. And of course, the famous line at the end of The Great Gatsby, I guess this is a story about the Midwest after all. And this is the Midwest that he was mentioning in The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm.